As heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. My wife and I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2001. She had a family in the area, and she'd always wanted to be close to them. At first, we rented an apartment for a year while we settled into new jobs. Once the year was up and we had decided to stay in the area, we started looking for a house. By 2002, we moved into our own house, a one-story place that we found for a good price. The neighborhood was clean and quiet, and within a couple of months we had met most of the families on the block. It was a great place to live. My wife and I both worked about the same hours, so except for occasional overtime, we usually arrived home around the same time. This strange incident happened to us in September of 2002. It was a weekday, around the latter part of the month. I got home first and my wife about a half hour after me. We talked for a minute, but my wife wasn't feeling too well, so she went to the bedroom to lay down. I was sitting in the living room, watching some sports. About 15 minutes after my wife had gone to the bedroom, there was a knock at the front door. It was sort of loud and I didn't want it to wake her up, so I put my drink and the TV remote down and quickly got up. It was strange because the knocking just kept going. The person wouldn't let up. When I opened the door, there was this kid standing on the step. He was wearing a gray hooded top and his hands were stuck in the pockets. I wondered for a moment how he had been knocking because his hands were in his pockets. I'd never seen this boy in the neighborhood before. He was staring straight at me, and his look was rather mean. Before I even said anything, this kid says, I want to come into your house now. The hair on the back of my neck went up. This kid's tone was so cold. He looked about 10 years old, and this didn't sound right coming from him. I looked at him and realized his eyes were solid black. I felt like I was starting to panic. I don't know why I did it, but I looked beyond him, out to the street. Maybe I was hoping there was someone else out there, I don't know. When I looked back at the boy, I only glanced at his face. I couldn't stand those eyes. Then I glanced down and realized I couldn't really see his feet. I know how strange this sounds. I don't really know how to explain it. It's almost like his legs just faded away. I slammed the door on him and turned around to see my wife rushing into the room. She looked frightened and said to me, there's a kid knocking on the bedroom window and he has black eyes. I was so stunned I didn't know what to say. I opened the front door again, but there was no one there. I ran outside and went to the corner of the house where our bedroom windows were. Again, there was no one there. There must have been two of those kids, but I simply can't imagine that they were able to get away from the house so quickly. There was something so unnatural about the boy I saw standing on the steps, and I'd never understood why I couldn't see his feet. For a long time, I thought we had seen ghosts. It's only in the past year that we came across stories of the black-eyed kids on the internet. We now believe this is what we witnessed. Thankfully, they never returned. Submitted by Anonymous I'm Darren Marlar. And this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In October of 1943, a U.S. Navy destroyer was supposedly turned invisible and teleported from Philadelphia to Norfolk. But did it really happen? We'll look at the truth behind the Philadelphia experiment. The Witchcraft Act of 1735 ended the gruesome practice of burning witches at the stake, making it illegal to accuse anyone of having magical powers. Yet in 1944, Helen Duncan was convicted under this very law for fraudulent spiritual activities. Despite her claims of contacting spirits through ectoplasm and even revealing classified naval secrets, 
she was sentenced to prison. Her trial was one of the last times the Witchcraft Act was used before being replaced in 1951, but her supporters continue to campaign for her pardon. Once a powerful festival, Dies Sanguinis, or Day of Blood, honored the Roman goddess of war, Bellana, with animal sacrifices and blood rituals. The festival showcased Rome's military strength and dedication to victory. Although the rise of Christianity and the fall of the Roman Empire eventually ended the festival, its legacy still sheds light on the fascinating nature of ancient Roman culture. The Dardine family was found brutally murdered in their home near Ina, Illinois, leaving residents and investigators stumped. Yet even after a confession by Tommy Lynn Sells, the truth is still a mystery. But first, described as childlike beings with eerie, coal-black eyes, no iris or pupils, and pale white skin, a scourge of mysterious black-eyed children have been reported all over the world. There are hundreds of reports of black-eyed children, often seen in groups of two or more, who ask for permission to enter the person's home or vehicle. Witnesses often report an overwhelming feeling of dread and despair in their presence. What the black-eyed children seek is not known, nor is it known exactly what they are. We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear my other podcasts including Church of the Undead and a sci-fi podcast called Auditory Anthology, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, plus you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. They might knock on your door on a late, wintry night. You may see them approaching your car while you're waiting at the signal or gas station. It might seem like they need help, or they might just stand still for no reason. These children do not look threatening. They would want to get in your house or your car. They will be persistent. Suddenly, you will notice something is not right about these children. Their eyes, pure black from lid to lid, dead, black orbs devoid of sclera or iris will chill up your spine you finally come across the black-eyed children. Black-eyed children, or black-eyed kids, is an urban legend of paranormal creatures that resemble children between the ages of 6 and 17. These creatures with pale skin and black eyes have reportedly been seen hitchhiking, panhandling, or at the doorsteps of residential homes. Dozens of stories keep circulating, all following a very similar pattern kids with eyes completely blacked out appear at people's home or vehicle, knock on the door, and then insist upon getting inside. Anyone who encountered them has almost immediately felt an overwhelming sense of dread. Besides blacked out eyes, these children typically appear normal. Sometimes their attire seems outdated. In extremely unusual instances, people have reported encountering creatures with talon-like feet, no one knows where or how these creatures pop up. Conspiracy theorists believe that black-eyed children are aliens trying to reach out to their Earth. Demonologists believe they are children of the devil himself, and if you let them in, you are allowing the devil to enter your life. They want to enter your home to call their parents. However, upon making eye contact, it seems like there is a much more sinister plot to their story. Some people claim these children have existed since the 1980s. However, most sources say that the legend originated in 1996 in posts written by a Texas reporter named Brian Bethel, where he wrote about two alleged encounters with the black-eyed children. He said that he encountered two children in Abilene, Texas, with pale skin and black eyes. In 2012, Bethel retold his story on the TV show Monsters and Mysteries in America, 
He then wrote an article for the Abilene Reporter News where he described his experience again. One of the stories goes like this. In the snowy town, within the middle of nowhere of Vermont, an elderly couple heard the sound of three loud knocks on their door. They opened the door and saw two children, a boy and a girl. Parents will be here soon. May we come in? The children did not make eye contact and just stood there in the doorway. The elderly couple were hesitant, but after a while they let the boy and girl inside. The kids settled on the couch, while the wife made some hot cocoa and the husband asked them questions that went unanswered. The wife returned and noticed that her cat was scared and angry with the children. May we please use the restroom? The wife looked at the kids and she finally saw them. The children's eyes were as black as a starless universe. She directed them to the bathroom and returned to her husband who was covering his face with his hand. Did you see their eyes? The husband then showed her his hand full of blood from a nosebleed. The power suddenly went out and the house turned as dark as the kids' eyes. The wife headed to the restroom and was confronted by the voice of the kids at the end of the hall uttering, Our parents are here! The kids then exited the house, leaving the door wide open. The wife then noticed that there were two men at the end of the driveway. The men were very tall and slender. The wife waved but did not receive the same friendly gesture back. The two men and children then drove away together in one car. The power then came back on a little later after the kids left. Throughout the next week, weird things happened in the house. Three out of four cats went missing, and the fourth had been found dead in a pool of its own blood. The husband continued to have nosebleeds and finally went to the doctor, where he was diagnosed with very aggressive skin cancer. This legend even crossed bodies of water and landed in the great land of the UK, where in 2014, the Daily Star wrote three front-page stories about sightings of the black-eyed children in the haunted pub in Staffordshire. Ghost hunters who believed that the black-eyed children were extraterrestrials, vampires, or ghosts took these alleged sightings very seriously. Nowadays, people still claim to see the black-eyed children when driving late at night down an empty road, or outside of their window late at night, or even lurking in the shadows of their room. Many people have reported seeing the black-eyed children standing in the corner of their room during their episodes of sleep paralysis or even waking up in the middle of the night because they sensed someone was watching them, and in the shadows were these children. The first reported sighting was in 1998, and since then, many people have claimed to have encountered them. In one well-known case, journalist Brian Bethel, as I mentioned before, was sitting in his car in a parking lot on January 16, 1998, when two boys approached him, asking for a ride. He immediately felt a surge of fear and anxiety but resisted the urge to let them in. As he closed the window, the boys became aggressive, and when Bethel looked into their eyes, which were as black as coal, he felt overwhelming fear. He quickly drove away, leaving them on the side of the road. In another instance, a man from Boise, Idaho received a frightened call from his friend who had been out with his girlfriend. They had stopped at a mini-mart for snacks when two kids approached their car, asking for a ride to a bus stop. Both kids had completely black eyes and spoke with a confidence that seemed unusual for their age. Despite the unsettling feeling, the man felt a strong urge to open the door as if the kids were controlling his mind. Eventually, the kids left and as the couple was driving away, they were hit by a truck and killed. The truck driver said he swerved to avoid two kids standing by the road. Are these stories just pranks, or are the black-eyed children something more? They are typically described as having pale, plastic-like skin and a lifeless look. Those who claim to have met them often report feeling uneasy or controlled, the children usually ask to be let inside or to have a ride somewhere. Whether they're real or not, it's best to be cautious. Coming up, we'll hear a few first-hand encounters from those who have come face-to-face -face with the black-eyed kids.
there is a knock at the door late at night. You answer it to find two small children standing there. You're suddenly filled with an inexplicable fear. Let us in, they say. We need to use the phone. It's at that point the fear turns to utter dread as you see that these kids have completely black eyes. The Black Eyed Kids is an exploration of this terrifying phenomenon using true stories of encounters with black eyed kids submitted to the My Haunted Life 2 website. G. Michael Vasey examines the evidence and investigates the terrifying black eyed kids phenomenon, coming to some startling and shocking conclusions. Are they demonic soul eaters responsible for the disappearance of some of the 90,000 Americans missing at any point in time? Or is this just another urban legend, another boogeyman designed to keep you awake at night? Listen to the book and find out. The Black Eyed Kids by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. There is no shortage of people reporting their experiences with black-eyed kids. Here are just a handful sent in by those who had the encounters. Kiris Holdsworth met the creatures in 2009. It was warm the night Holdsworth walked to her apartment from a friend's house in Lisburn, a city of 71,465 in Northern Ireland near Belfast. Then 18-year-old Kiris Holdsworth didn't know terror waited for her at home. It was about 10.45, she said, of that night in 2009. I was only 18 and had a small flat in a very rough part of the neighborhood. That's why it unsettled me when I saw two boys standing in my small patch of grass, which I called my yard. The boys, one about 16 years old, the other 13 or 14, stood with their backs to Holdsworth. I edged around the corner and, as if they knew I was there, both turned around to face me at the same time. They were just merely boys, she said. As the teenagers turned to face her, she felt more than just unsettled. I felt raw fear when I laid eyes on them, she said. Holdsworth stopped a few yards from them, a fist in her handbag wrapped around a tin of pepper spray. I was ready to defend myself if one of them made any sudden movements, she said. But they didn't. They seemed to know what she was thinking. No need for that, the older one spoke calmly and maturely. We just want to borrow your phone, miss. Her knuckles began to turn white as her grip tightened on the pepper spray. They looked like any other teenager around these parts, she said. Hoodie, jeans, and grubby trainers, running shoes. But while the older one spoke, I zeroed down on his eyes. They were pitch black. No trace of white or pupil at all. Further depths of terror rushed through her, I made a silent gasp, she said. It was as if I was in terrible danger, that I had to get away. My heart rate went off. All she knew at that moment is that she had to get inside her apartment. I didn't know exactly what to do, so I marched toward my flat door, ignoring the two boys, she said. I fiddled around quickly in my bag, trying to find my keys. Please, miss, the younger boy said from behind her. My mother won't be happy if she doesn't know where we are. Something pulled at her mind to let them in, to help them. I wanted to obey them at first, considering that they were young, she said, but seeing their eyes took me away. I just had to get away from them both, and I knew if I obeyed them I was going to seriously regret it. No, I… she stammered. I couldn't get my words out, she said. My hands hit my keys and I swiftly opened my door and slid in. My heart was banging against my chest. Shaking. Holdsworth fixed a cup of coffee, sat on the sofa in her living room, turned on the television, and tried to calm down. I didn't bother to check if they were still there in case I stared into those soulless eyes, she said. A knock sounded on her front door. I ignored it. It knocked again, Holdsworth said. I felt in real danger. She stood and padded to the front door. Everything was silent for one second, two, three, then knuckles on the other side of the door rapped out three loud knocks. 
It scared me, making me jump back a few steps, she said. I was grateful that my door was completely made of wood. I looked through the peephole and almost died. The boys' faces filled the peephole. Both of them staring at me with those pitch black eyes, she said. The horrid feeling of dread completely overwhelmed me. Miss, we won't hurt you, we promise, one of the boys said. Anger momentarily overwhelmed Holdsworth's fear, and she threw open the door. The boys stood in the doorway, grinning at her. What do you want? she demanded. We want to use your phone, the older one said. No, she yelled. Just let us in to use the phone, he said. We won't hurt you. We have no weapons to hurt you with. Get away from my flat, she shouted, then slammed the door in their faces. Safely behind her solid wooden door, Holdsworth looked back through the peephole. The boys still stood there, but they were no longer smiling. That feeling of utter terror and danger ran through me, she said. She went through her apartment, made sure every door, every window was locked, then picked up the telephone. I called my friend to come around, that it was an emergency and I needed her help, she said, calling a friend other than police because she didn't want to draw attention to her apartment. Holdsworth's friend arrived ten minutes later. When I opened the door, I couldn't help but hug her, Holdsworth said. She told me two boys were standing in my yard, but they left once she arrived. She said they made her feel in danger. Holdsworth has since moved to a different neighborhood, but the terror of the night of the Black Eyed Kids stays with her. I always check through that peephole before I go to sleep, she said. I don't know exactly what those boys were, but I do know they meant me harm and that they weren't human in any way. I still get scared thinking about it. Someone else's encounter. In August 2014, a woman reported an encounter with a black-eyed child after hearing deathly screams while on a walk with her daughter near the marshy countryside of Cannock Chase in the county of Staffordshire, England. My daughter and I were walking through Birch's Valley when we heard the screams of a young child. I couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl, but they definitely seemed in distress and sounded very close to us, so we instantly started running toward the noise. We couldn't find the child anywhere and so stopped to catch our breath. That's when I turned around and saw a girl standing behind me no more than ten years old with her hands over her eyes. It was as if she was waiting for a birthday cake. I asked if she was okay and if she'd been the one screaming. She put her arms down by her side and opened her eyes. That's when I saw they were completely black, no iris, no white, nothing. I jumped back and grabbed my daughter. When I looked again, the child was gone. Another encounter with a black-eyed child was reported in Cannock Chase a month later, on September 13, 2014. My wife and I were walking through Cannock Chase near to Style Cop with our dog. Once we had entered the woodland and the road was no longer visible, we started to hear the giggling noise of a little girl. To our amazement, a child no taller than one meter, three feet in height, appeared as if out of nowhere further up the path in front of us. We stopped dead in our tracks after noticing her eyes had no color. She stared at us for around five minutes before running away into a densely grouped area of trees. An investigator told Daily Mail that the reports of black-eyed children have begun to increase since 2013. He said that during interviews with witnesses, descriptions of the black-eyed children were always similar and noted that during the past two years, they've been receiving an average of one black-eyed kid report every other month. Reports of black-eyed children are nothing new in Staffordshire. They've been recorded in the area since the 1980s, including this report from journalist Lee Brickley of a black-eyed child seen by his aunt in the area. In the summer of 1982, my aunt was 18 years old, and she and her friends would often meet on Cannock Chase in the evening time. One evening, just before dark, she heard a little girl frantically shouting for help. Rushing to locate the sound, she stumbled upon a dirt track and caught sight of the girl, about six years old, running in the opposite direction. When my aunt caught up, the girl turned around and looked in her eyes, and then ran off into the dark woodland. Her eyes had been completely black with no trace of white. According to Brickley, the aunt considered giving chase but decided against it, a decision he felt may have been life-saving. It seems likely that even if my auntie had continued to chase that little girl, she would never have caught her, because it wasn't a child at all, but an evil force. Several theories exist regarding the terrifying black-eyed children spotted around Staffordshire. 
Some feel the children are some sort of alien creature, while others allege that they are followers of the infamous Slender Man, or childlike vampires, or the ghosts of murdered children. A string of child murders reportedly occurred in the area during the 1960s. Still others believe that Staffordshire's black-eyed children are evil entities, seeking to enter the witness's vehicle or home for reasons that have yet to be revealed. Here are some other stories of black-eyed kid encounters, each story reported by the witness themselves in their own words. It was almost like a dream. I woke up to my dog Lucy barking. She was upright on the bed where my husband and I were sleeping with our 22-month-old daughter, staring at our door like an unknown stranger was out there rummaging around. I thought she was just freaking out over a house noise. We'd only had her for three months and she was still a puppy. It could have been anything – our roommate, a creek from the house settling, the awnings moving outside in the breeze. I wasn't too concerned initially. I decided the best bet would be to open the door and show her nothing was there. It sounds a bit silly, but it's what we do with our daughter when she gets scared and I figured it should work with a puppy too. I opened the door and she raced to the front door. She stood there snarling at the door. It was an angry, violent growl, one I had never heard her make before. I looked groggily at her and opened the baby gate blocking the doorway, planning to open the door and show her everything was okay. The second my hand reached for the deadbolt, Lucy went wild. She started barking and jumped toward me, and when I touched the metal, she suddenly changed her temper. She whimpered, almost like she was afraid and backing down. As her mannerism changed, so did mine. I wasn't calm anymore. My heart was racing and sinking at the same time. I had been flooded with a mixture of fear and dread. I looked through the peephole. I can't explain why I looked, but I did. Outside were two kids. One was slender and pale. Her hair was a light shade of honey blonde, and she wore it long about mid-back with long, thin, blunt bangs in the front that covered most of her eyes. She wore jeans, a light wash that's popular right now, and a thin-looking olive-colored pullover-style hoodie. She held the hand of a small girl who looked to be around three or four in the same style jeans and a button-down ivory cardigan. The smaller one looked at the floor shyly but had the same shade of hair, tied back in a ponytail. She held a stuffed toy under her free arm, and it was identical to the one my daughter has, as was their style of dress. Had it not been for the feeling of overwhelming dread and fear, I probably would have asked these children in and given them some tea or hot chocolate to get them out of the bitter cold. Something about them seemed off. At this point, I hadn't made any noise. I hadn't shushed the dog or grumbled, nothing. I hadn't turned on any lights. These kids had no indications I was at the door. The older one spoke. She had a voice that was mature, confident, strong, and accentless. She held her head tilted downward and I couldn't see her eyes. She said, We have to use your phone. I stood frozen in fear. How did she know I was there? She raised her head to face me directly, and that was when I saw her eyes. There was a reason I couldn't see them through her bangs before. They were black, or midnight blue, or a dark, dark purple. They were otherworldly. She said, Our mother is worried. I did not answer her. Slowly and silently, I backed away from the door, Lucy still cowering at my ankles. She kept talking, just let us in to use your phone. I took another step back, and with that step, the tone changed. At first, she seemed polite. When I took that second step back, she became commanding, almost hostile. We're not going to hurt you. If we wanted to do that, we would have broken in. I'll ask again, may we come in and use your phone? Lucy snarled at the door and I inched backward, though something inside me seemed to be slowly pulling me back toward the door. It wasn't a physical pulling, so much as a subconscious need to go back and let them in. Another Encounter Before my experience, I had never heard of anything having to do with the black-eyed kids. I was 12. I was sitting outside of a hairdresser's in an old Chevy pickup waiting for my mom to get her hair cut. About 15 minutes had passed and I saw some kid walking back and forth along the sidewalk in front of my parked car. At first I thought I recognized him as one of my friends from school, so I banged on the front windshield until he looked my way. It was not anyone I knew. At this point I was not scared at all. Not yet. The boy walked over to the side of my car and just… stares. 
I think, to let me get a good look at his eyes, to freak me out. Let me tell you, if you have never seen a black-eyed kid, you have no idea what to imagine. Pupils black as the night sky. The boy whispers, you must let me in. And then I locked the car doors and ducked down into the space below the seats. Five minutes later, he was gone. When my mother got into the car, she told me a boy with black eyes had come into the hairdresser's and had insisted for my mother to give him the keys to the car. Another encounter. Just as I dozed off, I heard a thumping coming from the front porch. Startled at first, I opened my eyes wide and scanned the room. Realizing it was most likely my cat scratching himself on the front porch, I dozed back off. Then again, the thumping. I got out of bed to run him off the porch, only to see that he wasn't there anymore. A few minutes later, I felt the sudden urge to look up at the kitchen window. There they were, the tops of two short-statured people's heads cresting the stairs just above my window frame. The people were just short enough to not see in the window, but I could see out. Ticked off, I went out to the kitchen, unlocked and opened the door, ready to run around to the side of the house and kick some little idiot's butts. Standing there, looking up at me, were two 10- or 11-year-old boys feeling of dread and the smell of mold almost made me vomit. The smaller of the two then spoke. May we use your telegraph? Huh? I just stared blankly at these boys, horrified of what I then realized. Their eyes were pitch black. He asked again to use my telegraph. There wasn't a sound to be heard. No crickets chirping, no dogs barking, no cars driving by, nothing. I tried to play it cool and ignore the fact that he didn't say telephone or phone or cell, anything that would have made any sense of the situation, and calmly replied, I don't have service at my house, sorry. The expressions on their faces turned to rage as I finished my sentence. And the stories go on and on. I'll link to a few other episodes of Weird Darkness with more Black Eyed Kid stories in the episode description. What could these children be? Are they ghosts? Demons, as I believe? Interdimensional beings, or something else entirely? Theories abound, but no one knows for sure. Some speculate that they are the lost souls of deceased children, trapped between worlds and seeking passage into our realm. Others believe they are malevolent entities, preying on the kindness of humans to infiltrate and wreak havoc. Encounters with black-eyed kids, or BEKs, leave individuals with an overwhelming sense of dread. Those who report these experiences often speak of an inexplicable compulsion to comply with the children's requests, coupled with a visceral reaction to flee. It's as if every instinct in their body is sounding an alarm that something is profoundly wrong. Skeptics dismiss these stories as the product of overactive imagination or hoaxes. They argue that in an age where information and misinformation can spread like wildfire, it's easy for such legends to take on a life of their own. Yet for those who claim to have come face to face with the black-eyed kids, the terror is all too real. As with all things paranormal, the truth remains elusive. The black-eyed kids lurk in the shadows of our collective consciousness, a modern boogeyman for the digital age. Whether they are mere figments of our darkest fears or harbingers of something more sinister, their legend continues to horrify. So the next time there is an unexpected knock at your door, you might want to peer through the peephole before you open it. You never know who or what might be waiting on the other side. When Weird Darkness returns, the Dardeen family was found brutally murdered in their home near Ina, Illinois, leaving residents and investigators stumped. Yet even after a confession by Tommy Lynn Sells, the truth is still a mystery. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. 
The Black Eyed Kids are an urban legend of vast proportions. The stories of small children turning up on people's doorsteps all across the world, spreading fear and terror, have only increased over time. This compilation of G. Michael Vasey's books on this scary phenomena include new material and new true stories, as well as the complete texts of The Black Eyed Demons Are Coming and The Black Eyed Kids. Supernatural expert G. Michael Vasey carefully investigates this truly terrifying phenomenon using real-life encounters with these scary supernatural beings. The result is an unsettling and sometimes terrifying book that'll have you fearfully anticipating that knock at your door late at night. Who and what are these mysterious visitors to the doorstep? Are they demons? Aliens? What do they want? Why do they need to enter your home? And what happens if they do? Small kids that ask to use your phone or for a ride, and yet those who encounter them are scared to death even before they notice their black eyes. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The following story is extremely graphic and refers to brutal murders, including that of a child. It should not be heard by children or those who might feel this kind of content is too much for them. You can find a time guide in the episode description so you can skip to the next story if you wish. On the evening of November 18, 1987, police went to the mobile home of 29-year-old Russell Keith Dardeen and his family near Ina, Illinois. He hadn't shown up for work that day. Inside, officers found the bodies of his wife and young son, both beaten to death. Russell's wife, 30-year-old Ruby Elaine Dardine, was pregnant and had been beaten so severely that she went into labor. Tragically, the killer or killers also beat the newborn to death. Investigators believed that these murders had happened the day before. Initially, police thought Russell was the main suspect but the next day they found his body in a nearby field. He had been shot and mutilated, and his car was parked near a police station in Benton. An examination showed he was murdered shortly after his family. People in Jefferson and Franklin counties were terrified because over 10 other murders had already taken place in the area over the previous two years. Many people armed themselves and some suffered mentally. Rumors spread that the murders were connected to Satanists but the police ruled that out, along with other possible motives like drug dealing, cheating, and gambling. There was no evidence of robbery or sexual assault, leaving the case a mystery. No suspects were named in the murders until the 2000s, when a serial killer named Tommy Lynn Sells confessed. He was already on death row in Texas for killing a teenage girl. However, he wasn't charged because Texas prison officials wouldn't let him leave the state to help with the investigation in Illinois. Also, the Dardeen family and police doubted his story. Keith and Elaine Dardeen both used their middle names. Keith, who grew up in Mount Carmel, bought a trailer home in 1986 after finishing the training for his job at a treatment plant near Rent Lake. Elaine, originally from Albion, moved to join him with their two-year-old son, Peter. They rented land from a farming couple nearby. Keith worked at the plant, while Elaine found a job at an office supply store in Mount Vernon. In their free time, they were part of a music team at a small Baptist church, where Keith sang lead vocals and Elaine played the piano. In 1987, Elaine became pregnant with their second child, and they had already picked out names – Ian if it was a boy and Casey if it was a girl. They wanted a bigger place for their growing family, so they put their mobile home up for sale. But that wasn't the only reason for their planned move. Keith's mother, Joanne Dardeen, said Keith told her he wanted to leave Ina even if he could not find a job elsewhere because the area was becoming too dangerous. In the previous two years, there had been 15 murders in Jefferson County, 
starting with the killings by Thomas Odell, who murdered his parents and three siblings in 1985. Despite some of the murderers being caught and convicted, people in the area were still scared. Keith's friend mentioned that after a 10-year-old girl was raped and murdered in May 1987, Keith became so protective that he didn't even let a young woman who came to their trailer one night use their phone. On November 18th, Keith, who was usually a dependable worker at the treatment plant, didn't show up for a shift. He didn't call his boss to explain, and phone calls to his home went unanswered all day. His supervisor contacted Keith's parents, who were divorced but still lived near each other in Mount Carmel. They didn't know where their son could be. Keith's father, Don Dardine, called the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office and decided to drive to Ina with the house key to meet deputies at Keith and Elaine's mobile home near Illinois Route 37 and the old Illinois Central Railroad tracks. Inside, they found the bodies of Elaine, their young son Peter, and a newborn baby girl all lying in the same bed. Elaine had been tied up and gagged with duct tape and beaten to death, apparently with a baseball bat that had been a birthday gift for Peter from Keith. Elaine had been beaten so brutally that she went into labor and gave birth to the baby girl who was also tragically beaten to death. Keith wasn't there, and his car, a red 1981 Plymouth, was missing. Investigators suspected Keith had murdered his family and was on the run. Armed police searched for him at his mother's house in Mount Carmel. However, the search ended the next day when hunters discovered his body in a wheat field near Rand Lake College. He'd been shot three times, and his genitals had been mutilated. The Plymouth was later found outside the police station in Benton, about 11 miles south of the Dardines' home, with bloodstains inside. News of the murders made people in the area even more scared. Many began carrying shotguns in their vehicles. After high school basketball games, students would wait inside the school building for their parents to pick them up instead of hanging out outside like usual. The early information from police was limited and sometimes conflicting, leading to rumors. The coroners from the two counties disagreed on whether Keith died from a head injury or being shot. Some believed he was injured by being dragged from a car. The circumstances around Elaine giving birth to her baby girl, who died shortly after, led to rumors that the baby had been violently removed from her womb. With the mutilation of Keith's genitals, many people speculated that Satanists had performed a ritual sacrifice or that the murders were committed by a serial killer connected to the other unsolved cases in the area. Dr. Richard Garrison, a family doctor and Jefferson County coroner, said his patients frequently talked to him about the case and how much it troubled them. One man who lived half a mile from the Dardines' trailer said that he couldn't sleep and had lost 14 pounds due to stress. The daughter of the Dardines' landlords later admitted that she kept her bedroom light on and read all night because she was so afraid. Robert Lewis, the Franklin County coroner, felt that the fear had gone too far. I don't think there's a rational basis for the near hysteria, he said, that people are frightening each other. According to him, people were so scared that if someone ran out of gas, they would not ask nearby houses to help but would walk to the highway to hitch a ride instead. Local police teamed up with the Illinois State Police to investigate the crime. Thirty detectives worked, full-time, following leads and interviewing around 100 people, but none of it led anywhere. They took a suspect into custody early on, but released him after questioning, and a co-worker of Keith's, who reportedly had a dispute with him, was also cleared. No one who knew the couple had anything negative to say about them. A small amount of marijuana was found in the trailer, but it wasn't enough to suggest that they were selling it. Police even thought it might have been left behind by the killer. The autopsies found no drugs or alcohol in any of the victims. The coroners determined that all the Dardines died within an hour of each other. The bodies in the trailer had been killed about 12 hours before they were found, and Keith had been dead for 24 to 36 hours when his body was discovered. This timeline made it challenging to figure out what happened, since Keith's body was found far from the trailer. It was unclear if he had been killed where he was found or at the trailer with his family. At the trailer, the killer or killers had carefully arranged Elaine's body in bed with her children's bodies and had cleaned up the scene, indicating that they were not in a rush to leave. The police speculated the crime likely happened at night, given that the trailer was near a busy highway and could be seen from Interstate 57. 
They were also unsure if there was just one killer or several. Figuring out the motive behind the attack was especially tricky. The back door was left open, and there were no signs of forced entry. Valuable items like a VCR and a portable camera were left out in plain sight, and cash and jewelry were untouched. This ruled out robbery as the reason. Elaine hadn't been raped or assaulted either. The police also found no proof that Keith or Elaine were involved in any affairs that could have triggered a jealous rage. They wondered if Keith had gambling debts after finding a pile of papers with sports scores in the house. But Keith's mother, Joanne Dardine, said her son was so careful with money that he would resell 50-cent sodas at work to save up for Peter's college fund. Robert Lewis, the Franklin County coroner, believed the Dardines were specifically targeted. I believe it was a very personal, deliberate thing, he told a local newspaper. A police expert on cults said that the rumors about Satanists were not true, since those groups often mutilate bodies more severely, collect organs, and leave symbols or candles behind. None of that was found at the Dardine home. Police admitted that the Dardines were likely chosen on purpose, but wondered if the killers might have mistaken their identity. Joanne Dardine later suggested other possible motives. She believed someone could have wanted Keith to sell drugs, but he refused, or that someone liked Elaine and she rejected them, causing the person to kill the family. We just don't know, she said in 1997. Eventually, the police ran out of leads and had to focus on other cases. Two FBI profilers reviewed the evidence and offered some suggestions, but the crime didn't fit their usual patterns, making it tough to analyze. Keith's mother, Joanne Dardine, tried to keep the public interested in solving the case. Throughout the 1990s, she regularly called the one detective still working on it, sharing potential leads that she had heard or asking for updates. She collected 3,000 signatures from locals to petition The Oprah Winfrey Show, hoping that they would feature the case. They turned her down, saying the story was too violent for daytime TV. America's Most Wanted initially refused for similar reasons, but later aired a segment in 1998. Unfortunately, no new leads came from it. Police briefly suspected a serial killer, Angel Maturino Resendez, who was then using the alias Rafael Resendez Ramirez after he surrendered in Texas in 1999. He often traveled by hopping freight trains and targeted people living near the tracks, usually beating them to death. While this pattern seemed similar to the Dardine murders, Illinois authorities couldn't find a connection. Another serial killer in Texas soon caught the attention of investigators in Illinois. On December 31, 1999, Tommy Lynn Sells cut the throats of two girls near Del Rio, Texas. One of the girls survived and helped the police identify him. He was convicted and sentenced to death for that murder and another earlier in 1999 where he had killed a girl in San Antonio. While awaiting trial, he confessed to several other murders that he had committed while traveling around the country, often by hopping trains. One of the murders he confessed to was the Dardine family. Sells said he couldn't remember the details of all the murders he'd admitted to, which he attributed to blocking them out because of abuse he'd suffered as a child. However, he claimed to remember the Dardine murders clearly. In the mid-1980s, he was living near St. Louis, about 90 miles northwest of Jefferson County, making money through various jobs, including working at fairs or day labor. He often traveled by catching rides with truckers or hopping on trains. Sells said he became familiar with the Ina area this way. He claimed that during a trip in November 1987, he met Keith at a truck stop near Mount Vernon or a local pool hall. According to his story, Keith invited Sells to his house for dinner. After dinner, Sells planned to leave, but claimed Keith propositioned him for a sexual encounter, which made him angry. Sells forced Keith to drive to the field where his body was later found and killed him there. He then returned to the trailer and killed Elaine and Peter to eliminate witnesses. In another version, Sells said he simply got off a train near Ina, saw the for sale sign on the Dardine trailer, and thought it would be a good target. He waited until the right time, knocked on the door, and told Keith he was interested in buying the trailer. He then overpowered Keith, forced him to bind and gag his family, and took him to the field where he killed him. Sells claimed he raped Elaine and then beat her, Peter, and the newborn to death before cleaning up and driving Keith's car to Benton. 
For some investigators, the execution of Tommy Lynn Sells in 2014 by Texas was considered justice for the Dardines, even though he was never formally charged with their murders. He remains the number one suspect, said Jefferson County State's attorney Douglas Hoffman after Sells' execution. Sheriff Roger Mulch agreed, and a deputy who interviewed Sells in Texas mentioned that Sells knew specific details about the crime that had never been shared publicly. Even so, these officials admit that Sells often exaggerated details in his confessions, leaving some uncertainty about the murders he claimed to have committed. Other investigators remain doubtful because much of what Sells said was already reported publicly. When asked about certain private details of the Dardeen murders, Sells sometimes got them wrong or made lucky guesses. Sells acknowledged these doubts in a 2010 interview with the Southern Illinoisan, stating, "...they say there's no physical evidence tying me to the Dardines, but there wasn't for any of them because they wasn't looking for me. I moved. I was always a transient." The police in Texas confirmed Sells had committed 22 murders but believed he was also confessing to crimes that he had not committed in an attempt to avoid the death penalty, similar to what another serial killer, Henry Lee Lucas, had done. Illinois authorities wanted to bring Sells to Ina to see if he could show them locations relevant to the Dardeen murders, but Texas laws prevented death row inmates from being taken out of state. With no additional evidence, the prosecutors in Illinois chose not to charge Sells. Family and friends, the Dardines, also doubted Sells' story. They couldn't believe that Keith would invite a stranger to dinner, especially given the recent murders in the area. A friend pointed out that Keith would not even let a young girl use their phone, so he definitely would not have invited a random 22-year-old man inside. They also found Sells' claim that Keith made a sexual advance hard to believe, as there was no evidence of that. Detectives who spoke to Sells felt he might have made up that detail to justify the crime, as he often included similar stories and other confessions to make it seem like the victims provoked him. Joanne Dardeen's opinion about Tommy Lynn Sells' involvement in her family's murder changed over time. In 2000, after hearing about his confession, she told the Chicago Tribune that she was as certain as the police were that he was responsible. She wanted to talk to him to clarify any remaining doubts. I've always wanted to know every detail, she said. Some people may think that's too much, but if someone hurts my family, I want to know why. Seven years later, around the 20th anniversary of the murders, she felt 99% sure that he was the killer, but still wanted to talk to him, wondering if he had help from someone else. In 2010, Sells doubted that talking would help. Joanne wants to talk to me. If she wants to come here and talk to me, scream, yell, kick, or hit me, she should have that right, he said. But he believed that no apology would help her find peace. Sorry isn't going to fix it. I could say sorry every day and it wouldn't stop her pain. Pain doesn't just go away. The two never had that conversation. By the time Sells was executed in 2014, Joanne believed he wasn't the person who killed her family. I wanted him to stay alive until I knew for sure that he didn't do it she told the Associated Press afterward. What he said didn't match what I know about Keith. She added, a lot of people think it's over, but to me, it's not. The case remains unsolved. Coming up, the Witchcraft Act of 1735 ended the gruesome practice of burning witches at the stake, making it illegal to accuse anyone of having magical powers. Yet in 1944, Helen Duncan was convicted under this very law for fraudulent spiritual activities. Despite her claims of contacting spirits through ectoplasm and even revealing classified naval secrets, she was sentenced to prison. Her trial was one of the last times the Witchcraft Act was used before being replaced in 1951, but her supporters continued to campaign for her pardon. But first, in October of 1943, a U.S. Navy destroyer was supposedly turned invisible and teleported from Philadelphia to Norfolk. But did it really happen? The true story behind the Philadelphia experiment is up next.
What goes on in the mind of a murderous killer? What is it about some people that lead them to commit murder? Is there something that is different or is it simply a switch that gets turned on? Murderous Minds, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines offers a look into the lives of individuals who didn't just become killers but who managed to avoid the media storm that usually accompanies them. Inside, you will hear about people like Sante Kimes, a 65-year-old mother who was driven by greed and who committed multiple murders with her son. Robert James Ackerman, the MBA graduate who murdered three people in order to continue getting lap dances from a stripper that he became infatuated with. Larry Jean Ashbrook, who became deluded into thinking that strangers were accusing him of murder. When he could not take it anymore, he carried out a massacre at the Wedgwood Baptist Church. And more. Each story harbors its own distinct narrative and reasoning for the perpetrators of these heinous crimes. Along with the background to the case, their lives, and the aftermath of their actions. Sometimes the truth is more appalling than anything fiction can provide, and Murderous Minds proves it once again. Murderous Minds, Volume 1, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines by Ryan Becker, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Philadelphia experiment, if the stories are to be believed, went something like this. In 1943, the newly launched destroyer USS Eldridge was in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, being equipped with secret devices. These top-secret generators were supposedly designed to make the ship invisible to enemies. On a clear summer day, the generators were switched on and a strange greenish-blue glow surrounded the ship. Then, right in front of everyone's eyes, it disappeared. People at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Virginia reported seeing the Eldridge appear in their waters before it vanished again, only to reappear hours later back in Philadelphia. The crew reported symptoms like nausea, insanity, and burn marks, while others said they were fused into the ship's metal floors and walls or reappeared inside out. But here's the catch. Experts and most historians believe this strange story never really happened. The story of the Philadelphia experiment has persisted for decades, despite most of it being speculation. Out of all the rumors, only a few facts are known for sure. One is that Morris K. Jessup, an astronomer who studied UFO propulsion, received a letter from a man named Carlos Allende, also known as Carl Allen. Allende claimed he had seen a secret experiment at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard in 1943. He said that he was on the SS Andrew Furuseth when he saw the USS Eldridge disappear and reappear in Virginia before vanishing again and showing up back in Philadelphia. Allende claimed this experiment was proof of Einstein's unified field theory. Jessup tried to investigate Allende's wild claims but couldn't find any physical evidence. In the end, he dismissed Allende as a fool. The story might have ended there, but in 1957 the Office of Naval Research ONR, contacted Jessup with a strange report. They had received a copy of Jessup's book, The Case for the UFO, link in the episode description, which explored how UFOs might fly. This copy was filled with notes in three different handwritings, with one claiming to belong to an alien. The notes seemed to reflect advanced knowledge of physics and extraterrestrial technology. Because of unusual capitalization and punctuation, experts suspected the person who wrote them was not a native English speaker. Jessup believed these annotations were made by Carlos Allende, the mysterious man who had written to him earlier. The notes talked about Jessup's ideas and frequently mentioned the Philadelphia Experiment. For unclear reasons, the ONR decided to print 127 copies of the annotated book, which became known as the Vero Editions 
after the publisher Vero Manufacturing. This revived interest in the Philadelphia experiment. Aside from Melendez's claims and the Vero annotations, all reports of the Philadelphia experiment remain unverified, often seen as a hoax or dismissed because they contradict the laws of physics. Government agencies supposedly involved insist it never happened, and no official documents have ever surfaced. The only written mention of the Philadelphia experiment is in Jessup's book, with the mysterious annotations. Over the years, the Philadelphia experiment became a popular topic among conspiracy theorists. They created different versions of the story, suggesting causes ranging from government contact with aliens to paranormal interference. But the fact that Carlos Allende was the only witness made most people skeptical. In 1988, a man named Al Bielek claimed that he also witnessed the experiment, saying he was aboard the Eldridge when it vanished and was brainwashed to forget it. He said he only remembered after seeing a movie about the experiment. Despite his story, most people still believe the Philadelphia experiment was just a hoax. Today, many people believe the explanation given by Edward Dudgeon, a former Navy electrician stationed near the USS Eldridge in the summer of 1943. Dudgeon explained that the generators installed on both the Eldridge and his ship, the USS Engstrom, were intended to make them invisible, not to the eye but to the magnetic torpedoes fired by German U-boats. This process, called degaussing, prevented the ship from being detected by enemy weapons. Dudgeon also offered logical reasons for the ship's strange greenish-blue glow and appearance in Norfolk, Virginia. He said the glow was likely caused by St. Elmo's fire, a phenomenon similar to lightning. As for the ship's quick trip between Virginia and Philadelphia, he explained that the inland canals, closed to civilians, allowed military ships to complete the journey in just six hours instead of two days. Despite Dudgeon's reasonable explanation, some still prefer the more thrilling version of the story. Without official documents to confirm what happened, there's no concrete evidence for either side. The USS Eldridge was eventually transferred to Greece and renamed the HS Leon, where it was used during the Cold War. In the 1990s, it was scrapped for metal. The Witchcraft Act of 1735 marked a big change in British law. Unlike older witchcraft acts that allowed witch hunting and executing witches, this act took a completely different stance. It stated that witches didn't exist and made it a crime to accuse someone of having magical powers. Anyone who claimed to use magic, summon spirits, tell the future, or cast spells would be punished as a scam artist and could be fined or jailed. This law stopped the horrific practice of burning innocent people at the stake, which had taken the lives of thousands of women since medieval times. The Witchcraft Act stayed in effect for over 200 years and was often used, especially in the early 19th century, to combat ignorance, superstition, crime, and rebellion. Before it was replaced by the Fraudulent Mediums Act of 1951, it was used one last time in 1944 to prosecute Helen Duncan a 47-year-old Scottish woman. Her conviction and sentence earned her the title of Britain's Last Witch. Helen Duncan, born Helen McFarlane, was born in Callander, Scotland in 1897. As a child, she liked to pretend that she could predict the future, scaring her classmates with predictions of doom and destruction. This upset her mother, who was a devout member of the Presbyterian Church. At 18, she married Henry Duncan, a wounded war veteran, and they had six children together. To help support her family, Helen started hosting seances, where she claimed to summon spirits. With her husband's encouragement, she traveled around Britain conducting seances, giving comfort to families who wanted to speak with their deceased loved ones. One of Helen's tricks involved producing a strange, slimy substance called ectoplasm from her mouth and nose, which she said transformed into the spirits of the dead, allowing them to speak to their loved ones. She even fooled famous people like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. One of her believers, Vincent Woodcock, testified during her 1944 trial that Helen Duncan changed his life. He said his dead wife appeared in 19 seances he attended over three years. Once he brought his sister-in-law, 
and during the seance, ectoplasm came out of Helen's mouth and his wife's spirit appeared. The spirit asked Woodcock and his sister-in-law to come forward and placed the wedding ring in the sister-in-law's hand, saying, it's my wish that this happens for our little girl. A year later, the two got married, and they returned to another seance to receive the deceased woman's blessing. Not everyone believed in Helen Duncan's supernatural powers, though. In 1928, photographer Harvey Metcalf attended one of her seances and took photos of her supposed spirits. The pictures showed that the spirits were actually dolls made from painted papier-mâché masks covered in old sheets. Three years later, the London Spiritualist Alliance investigated and found that her ectoplasm was made of cheesecloth, paper, and egg whites. They believed she swallowed this material before the seance and then regurgitated it during the performance. When they made her swallow dye before a seance, she didn't produce any ectoplasm. Attempts to x-ray her were difficult because she ran out of the lab, slapping her husband and causing a scene on the street. Harry Price, a researcher, said she became hysterical, screaming and tearing her seance clothes. When she finally returned, she insisted on being x-rayed, which Price thought was because she had secretly given the cheesecloth to her husband during the chaos. When doctors asked her husband to empty his pockets, he refused. In 1933, Helen Duncan was caught faking her act during a seance in Edinburgh. The spirit of a girl named Peggy appeared, but an audience member quickly grabbed the figure, and when the lights were turned on, it was revealed to be a doll made from an undershirt. Duncan was charged with fraud and fined 10 pounds sterling. But Duncan's career didn't end there. She kept up her spiritual activities and was in high demand during World War II, especially among families of soldiers lost in action. In 1941, at a seance in Portsmouth, which was the Royal Navy's headquarters, the spirit of a deceased sailor supposedly appeared. The sailor's ghost revealed that a British battleship, HMS Barham, had sunk after being torpedoed by a German submarine costing over 800 lives. The people at the seance were shocked because this news had not been announced publicly. The HMS Barham had actually sunk a few days earlier, but the war office had kept it secret, only telling the families affected. With so many families involved, the information was not well guarded, and Duncan managed to hear about it and use it to her advantage. However, the Navy couldn't afford to take any risks. What if Duncan really did have the ability to reveal classified military information to enemies? With the crucial D-Day landings coming up, the British government ordered her arrest. On January 19, 1944, undercover police officers went to a seance in Portsmouth, when a white shrouded figure appeared, the police jumped on it and discovered it was Duncan herself, wrapped in a white cloth. Duncan was initially arrested and charged under the Vagrancy Act of 1824, a minor offense, but the authorities considered her actions serious and eventually charged her under Section 4 of the Witchcraft Act, which dealt with fraudulent spiritual activities and carried a heavier penalty. Her trial became a media sensation with many witnesses testifying in her defense. Despite this, the jury found her guilty, and she was sentenced to nine months in prison. After her release, Duncan returned to holding seances, even though she had promised the court she would stop. She was arrested again in 1956 and died shortly afterward at her home in Edinburgh. Duncan's trial played a role in getting the Witchcraft Act repealed. Winston Churchill was outraged, when he learned that such an old law was used in a modern trial, he wrote to Herbert Morrison at the Home Office criticizing the use of the Witchcraft Act and asking for an explanation, saying that it was wasted time and resources. In 1951, the Witchcraft Act was repealed and replaced by the Fraudulent Mediums Act, partly thanks to the efforts of spiritualists and Labor MP Thomas Brooks. Over the years, Duncan's supporters have repeatedly tried to have her pardoned, but the Scottish Parliament has consistently rejected these efforts. Coming up, once a powerful festival, Dies Sanguinis, or Day of Blood, honored the Roman goddess of war, Bellana, with animal sacrifices and blood rituals. The festival showcased Rome's military strength and dedication to victory, Although the rise of Christianity and the fall of the Roman Empire eventually ended the festival, 
its legacy still sheds light on the fascinating nature of ancient Roman culture. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Dies Sanguinis, meaning Day of Blood or Day of the Bloody Sacrifice, was a sacred but intense day on the Roman calendar. Celebrated each year, on March 24th, it was dedicated to Bellana, the goddess of war, bloodshed, and violence. On this day, Romans sacrificed animals, including bulls, in the Temple of Bellana to honor the goddess. The exact origins of Dies Sanguinis aren't well documented, but it's thought to be one of the oldest festivals in Rome possibly dating back to the early Roman Republic. Some believe it was linked to ancient agricultural practices because March 24th was considered the start of the farming year and a time for spring planting. The sacrifices may have been performed to ensure good crops and win favor with the Roman gods. Another theory ties Dea Sanguinis to the Roman military. Bellana was central to the Roman army, and her followers believed that by offering her animal blood, she would ensure victory in battle and the blood of their enemies. Dia Sanguinis might have been a way for ancient Rome to show its dedication to military strength and to reinforce its identity as a warrior nation. This sacred day was used to honor the Roman army and demonstrate the people's commitment to winning wars. It was also an important day for recruiting soldiers and swearing loyalty oaths. On Dia Sanguinis, Roman priests would sacrifice animals, especially bulls, at the Temple of Bellana, which was dedicated to the war goddess. The temple was built to commemorate a military victory over the Sabins. The blood from the sacrifices was used in religious rituals throughout the day. Religious and military processions marked Dia Sanguinis, including the Sali, a group of twelve priests who carried sacred shields and performed dances to show Rome's military power. These performances were a key part of the day's smaller rituals. Over time, celebrations of Dia Sanguinis became less frequent. This was due to the rise of Christianity and changing beliefs among Romans. Philosophers like Seneca and Epictetus focused on inner peace and morality rather than war, influencing many people. Christianity also spread ideas of love and forgiveness, which conflicted with Rome's violent traditions. As the new religion became more popular, traditional Roman rituals were seen as pagan and incompatible with Christian values. Soon, Roman values shifted away from the warlike focus that had once been central to celebrating Dies Sanguinis. As the empire became more stable and secure, Romans prioritized peace and prosperity over military conquests. They realized they could enjoy a strong economy and stable government without relying on war to maintain their way of life. This led to the gradual decline and eventual suppression of traditional Roman festivals like Dies Sanguinis. Another factor that contributed to the end of Dies Sanguinis was the fall of the Roman Empire itself. As the empire weakened and Germanic tribes invaded, they carved out new kingdoms and territories, replacing Roman customs with new forms of government, religion, and social organization. Dies Sanguinis once held significant cultural and religious importance, honoring the military and displaying Rome's strength. Although it faded into history, its legacy provides valuable insight into the complex nature of ancient Roman culture. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. 
You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information or sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find my other podcasts including Church of the Undead and a sci-fi podcast, Auditory Anthology. Also on the site, you can visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, mugs, and other merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories, authors, and sources I used in the episode notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And a final thought. Defeated is the man sitting down, afraid to get up and take a step. It's better to stay sitting down and defeated than try to get up and walk. The winner is the man jumping up to run even though he will trip and fall. He keeps getting up to run. One day he will cross that finish line and stand in victory at the end. The winner is the man not afraid to try and try and try. Janice Harris I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey, good news, weirdos! We have just extended our sale in the Weird Darkness store, thanks to Mother's Day. So now through May 12th, everything in the Weird Darkness store is up to 35% off. That means huge savings on hoodies, phone cases, wall art, buttons, totes, clothes for your kids, and everything else. Maybe something for mom. T-shirts are only 16 bucks, and we've got the really big ones for the guys, too. Start shopping at WeirdDarkness.com slash store, and if you don't like what you see on the Weird Darkness store page, you can use the search function and find what you do like because there are hundreds of thousands of designs there to choose from. Start shopping by clicking on Store at WeirdDarkness.com. Remember, the sale ends May 12th, so jump on it now. WeirdDarkness.com slash store. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.